give worship to your name. Oh, Lord, worship to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give worship to your name. Chad would make his way up. Let's go to the top now. I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name. Hallelujah. It's good to see you guys this evening. It's good to be here together. It's really good to see you, Brother Craig. God bless you. It's good to see you sitting with your family back there. I'm sure they're happy. They're probably happier than we are, but we're pretty happy. God bless you. Brother John, God bless you, Brother John. It's good to see you. You guys look good. You don't look tired or anything. We'll see. I've only got about an hour and a half, two hours to preach. We'll see if you make it all the way, brother. <laughs> God bless you. While we're standing, let's take our Bibles and turn to the uh, to the uh, John, the First John. Let's go to First John. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to the trip report. I've got little snippets from here and there, and everything I've heard sounds amazing, and I just can't wait to hear the whole story. And so we're going to have to be patient. Amen. Uh, I did want to make an announcement. I don't want to forget. I want to make an announcement for uh, May 20th. May 20th is not this coming Sunday, but the following Sunday. And I already let you know that we're going to have a kids service at 4 p.m. Uh, Brother Craig Brewer is going to minister that for us. So if you've got any kids that are not old enough to be in the youth group yet, 12 years and under, they're welcome to come. And uh, we're going to have a little bit of food and fellowship afterwards in the fellowship hall. And so we'll, we'll announce more about that later. But don't forget that. But I also wanted to let you know that the trustees and Brother Steve Hollinger, our treasurer, are going to have the annual financial review immediately after the morning service in the fellowship hall. And what we've done in the past, we've always done it during the service time, but we just felt like it was too much of a distraction and interruption. So we got with the trustees and decided that we're going to do it immediately after service, 15 minutes after we dismissed the morning service, going over to the fellowship hall. And we'd like anybody that was interested, especially all tithe payers, if they could come. And then Brother Steve will go through the financial review and then the trustees will all be present, and when the meeting's over, or each of the trustees are going to speak for just a moment about what they're doing and what's going on, what's coming up, and then afterwards they're going to remain over in the fellowship hall. If you have any questions, you can ask them directly. So I'll be announcing this tonight and Wednesday, or tonight and Sunday and Wednesday again, but I just want to let everybody know and make plans for that. God bless you. Now let's read <clears throat> 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have, we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin. Let's just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. And we ask God that you would come tonight God, that you would be the speaker, that you would come in the power of your Holy Ghost, and that you would minister your word through these lips of clay. Lord, as we yield ourselves to your word, we ask, God, that you would lift us into higher heights and give us clearer vision and let us see your word like we've never seen it before. Lord, you're preparing us for that great final showdown and the catching away and the change in the body. And Lord, we just want to be ready. We just pray, God, that you would just make us ready by your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Keep your Bibles here <coughs> in the scripture. We're going to read a couple more. Amen. 
I've got a PowerPoint. If we could go ahead and bring up the PowerPoint, appreciate that. I just want to say before I forget and go any further that I really appreciate Brother Franco. Amen. He works... He works good. He works last minute. He works under pressure. He works under every condition possible. He works sometimes under ridiculous conditions, but he always manages to pull it off, and he does it with class and style, and I appreciate him helping me with this PowerPoint. There was just a visual that I wanted to have for this, and, and he made it work out, so I really appreciate that. And so I want to look at uh, 1 John 1 uh, and, and 7 again. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, See, this is so conditional, and we have to understand the condition. If we walk in the light as he is in the light. <clears throat> so it's conditioned on being where he is. Amen. We can't just walk in the light that was. We have to walk in the light, not that the light that he was in, but we walk in the light as he. Amen. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now that's what we all want. Every one of us wants the cleansing of the blood. Who wants the cleansing of the blood? Now there's a condition for that, amen? And the condition is that you are walking in the light as he is in the light. Right. Hallelujah. And then the conditions are met. Let's turn over to the Gospel of John chapter 5. The Gospel of John chapter 5. And we'll begin reading at verse 37. John chapter 5, verse 37. And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And you have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him you believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. So here Jesus finds them in this condition where they think they have life. They think they're in the light. But all the scriptures that they claim to believe now is speaking of Christ now standing in the form of Jesus Christ. And he's here all the word compiled now is standing before them speaking. And they're rejecting him. And he is in the light. And he is the light. And he is in the light. And now they are rejecting the very light that they claim to believe proving that they are in darkness. It doesn't matter what they thought or how they thought they were, the condition they thought they were in, the very fact that they rejected light when it was presented to them proved that they were in darkness. And he says, you have not his word abiding in you. Oh, this is key, friends. You have not his word abiding in you for whom he hath sent him you believe not. So now, now you understand that if his word abides in you, amen, and that word abiding in you is not something that you pick up along the way or something that you buy or something that you collect, amen, but that's the seed gene of God that was deposited there before the foundation of the world. When you came into this life, it was there. A portion of the word, a part of word was there. And if that word is in you, it manifests itself by recognizing the word for your day. By recognizing the light when it comes, the scripture when it's fulfilled. When the word comes forth, now all of a sudden when you see whom God has sent and you recognize your day and its message and the day and hour you believe, it vindicates that his word abides in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go back to chapter 1, same book, Gospel of John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Wow. That's still going on today. Verse 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So now the light is the life of men. The life of men is the light of men, and that light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Why? Because the word didn't abide in them. Let's turn over to John chapter 8. John 
just laying a foundation to work off. We just want to do a teaching tonight. In John chapter 8, verse 23, and he, and he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. How can he say something like that? How can he declare something like that? In verse 24, he says, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Now all of a sudden they found out that they're in darkness, that they're refusing the light, that they're in sin, and they're going to die in their sin. Why? Because they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe in present day truth. They didn't believe in the word, the word being made manifest. They didn't believe in it, so they were going to die in their sins. One more scripture I want to read in, in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. And I just want to look at this so we can realize that we ourselves were in the exact same position that the Pharisees were in. At one time in our life, we were in the same position that they were in. The difference between us and the difference between those Pharisees was that there was a word abiding inside. There was a portion of God already dwelling there in the soul. There was already a seed gene of God laying there, dormant, waiting to be awakened, but it was there. And the only thing that could awaken it, bring it to life, was the light. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Hallelujah. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You were in the same spot the Pharisees were in, but yet you were not in the same eternal condition as the Pharisees, amen, because you were never lost. You were lost, but never lost. Because you had your name written on the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world, and you could no more be lost than God was lost, amen? You come into, down into a condition where you needed redemption, amen? And the price was paid, the plan was set. You were never going to be lost. Even though you were in a lost condition, you were never going to be lost. Because God had a plan before the foundation of the world. Before the fall, your name was already in the book and there was a lamb already slain before you were ever born, before Adam ever fell, before anything had the opportunity of going wrong. It was already secure in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Now it's interesting <coughs> that the Apostle Paul puts himself in the same condition. Because if you had watched Paul's life, you would have never realized that he was walking in darkness, that he was walking under the power of the prince of the air, that he was steeped in all of this uh, darkness because he was, he, was, he was a religious man. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was taught in one of the most religious schools with one of the most religious trainings, amen? And he was in the right religion, but in the wrong way. And he looked right, and he acted right, and everything was right, but yet he includes himself in this scripture because no matter how much he was in the system, he was in the right school, that he was a Pharisee among Pharisees, he was still dead in sins and trespasses because the only thing that could bring him out of that was the light of his age, the word for his day. Hallelujah, I like that. Ephesians 5 Eight, one more verse. No, no, I mean five, not two, eight, five, eight, sorry. Five, eight. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. If you're a child of light, who's your father? The source of light. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. 
I, I titled this The Links of Redemption. Now this is just me. This is just a, a, some way in which I want to illustrate a thought. So don't get too hung up on this. This is just an illustration. But The Links of Redemption. And I want to look at a chain with all these links from the fall all the way back to the fullness of redemption. And I want to, I want to take a look at this bit by bit. Now, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So now we realize that, that, that Jesus came into the world, amen, not to condemn the world. But he, he, gave, he came into the world to, to, to shine the light so that somebody could see the light and the redemption could take place. They could come to life. But now we find that the world was already condemned. He didn't have to condemn the world. The world is already condemned. You didn't have to be condemned. You were already condemned. You didn't have to be judged. You were already judged because of the fall, because of hybridization, amen, because of the intermingling of the seed. The world was already in darkness. The world was already in a fallen condition. He didn't have to come to condemn the world. You were condemned already. Hallelujah. So now he comes to bring light, to bring you out of condemnation, to bring you out of the fall, to bring you out of that condition. He didn't come to put you in that condition. You're already in that condition. He came to bring you out of that condition. That's why to reject and to not believe leaves you in darkness, leaves you in a fallen condition, leaves you separated from God. It doesn't make you separated, it leaves you separated. Do we understand that? We were condemned already. So there was only one way to not be condemned. And that was to believe in him who God has sent. To walk in the light as he is in the light was the only path out. Brother Bam says, God doesn't send you to hell for being a sinner. God sends you to hell because you won't repent and take Christ as your savior. You refuse to take the right road. You send yourself to torment. You send your own soul to its eternal destination upon the free moral agency of your own convictions. God does not send anyone to hell. He never did and he never will. Men send themselves to hell because they refuse to accept the way of salvation. And then they make up their own ways of salvation. They make their own repeat after me prayers and their own doctrines and their own ideas about salvation, amen, and they send themselves because they refuse the light. So I wanna start looking at these links on this chain, amen, and we just got a couple just for an example. We won't go very far into this. So after the fall, we just wanna to come to Job. Now we know that at the fall, when, when, when God's son fell and his wife fell, and God comes down and he offers a substitutionary lamb. And when he offers that substitutionary lamb, he sets a pattern that he will accept a substitute in the blood of an innocent one to be a covering, amen, for his children. And now Job is in this substitutionary phase when we see Job in the book of Job. And Job has absolute confidence in the light for his age. When he has friends who come to him and accuse him of you're a secret sinner and you've done wrong and, and why don't you make it right? Well, of course Job had done wrong before. Everybody has done wrong before, but Job wasn't looking at his deeds. Job was looking at the sacrifice. Brother Ram tells us this, and he can stand confidently in front of all those accusers and say, I am righteous. I've done no wrong. I've done nothing to deserve this. What's he looking at? He's resting in the light for his day, and the light for his day is that he can offer a substitutionary sacrifice, an innocent lamb, and it will cover and atone for his transgressions. And he's got confidence in that. To him, it was light. But then we come to Noah's day, and now, we're looking at this, this chain of redemption as it 
moves along and you have to walk in the light as he is in the light. And now in Noah's day, God is going to come down and bring a destruction upon the earth. Amen. And, and, and now the only way out of this destruction is to listen to Noah's message. Now you can claim the substitution all you want. You can have faith in what Job had all you want and you can slay a thousand lambs and a thousand goats, but if you don't get into that ark, you're going to perish. Now the way of salvation has changed as the light moves and you have to walk in the light as he is in the light because the whole Old Testament is laying down a shadow and a pattern to be an example for us and you have to move as Christ moves through the Old Testament. Revealing his word more, revealing his attributes more, revealing himself, who is it? Is it Noah? No, it's Christ. And now the only path to salvation is in the ark. You can say, but God did this for Adam. God gave us this pattern. It's worked for hundreds of years. It has worked for thousands of years. Why can't we just stay? I know this is true, but what about this newfangled thing Noah's saying? How do I know Noah's right? How do I know he's not off his rocker? How do I know he's not a crazy old man? It didn't matter what you thought about Noah. It didn't matter what your opinion was. It didn't matter if he couldn't prove himself to you or give you credentials that made you feel satisfied. If you weren't in that ark, you were going to perish. Brother Bram says the reason people in Noah's day did not go into the ark is because they never recognized the message nor the messenger. That's the only reason they perished. That was it. That was the only reason. You could say they perished because they did bad things. They perished because they, 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 you know, because they, they cussed at somebody or they committed adultery. That's not why they perished, friends. Amen. Do you think that Noah and his sons did everything right? Do you think that they had never lied and that they'd never done anything wrong? Amen. The scripture says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He needed grace. For some reason, he needed grace. And now they didn't die because they were in adultery, amen? They didn't even die because they were taking unto themselves women. Because there was a way out of that mess. There was a way to overcome that disease. There was an over way to come out of that darkness, and it was the message of Noah. It didn't matter if they committed adultery. It didn't matter if they had stolen. It didn't matter if they had beat their wives. If they would have received the word and they would have repented and they would have humbled themselves to the word of God, they would not have perished if they would have been in the ark. They drowned because they were bad. No, they drowned because they didn't believe. Hallelujah. See, we can't read the Bible like we always used to read the Bible. We can't read the Bible like Sunday school stories. You've got to see the whole picture of redemption. And God, he made it, he would always make his plan so odd, so different. And he would always do it in a different way that the people weren't expecting, amen. They had come to realize that I can offer a substitutionary lamb. That had become old news. Everybody in the world understood that. They had seen it done, they had heard about it. From the time they were children, you could slay a lamb and the innocent blood could cover for you. But God has to make a way to where salvation is only available to the elect. So he made it, amen, by faith, so that it could be by grace to, the, to be sure that it would go to the seed. And only to the seed, because only the seed can have faith in the word for their day. That's why there were only eight souls saved in Noah's day, because there was only eight with the seed. Eight that could go in. And then I'm not so sure about Ham, so I don't know. Hallelujah. The reason they perished is because they didn't recognize the hour that they were living in. That's the reason. You know why people are gonna be left behind in tribulation? Not because they've done bad deeds, you've done bad deeds. Amen? Not because they lied, not because they stole, you've lied and you stole and you've been mean to your wife and you, you were rough with your kids and you did all kinds of rotten things in your life. Amen? But you're gonna go and they're not gonna go and there's only one difference. It's because you believe the message for your day. 
That's it. It's not about conduct. It's not about being perfect. It's about what you believe, and what you believe will manifest in a life, but it comes down to what you believe. Hallelujah. So now we come to Abraham, and Abraham had the message of the promised son. Romans 4, 35 says, 4, 4, 3 to 5 says, For what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Not that he was acting righteously. You've got that. Not that he was doing righteous deeds, amen? That's not why, amen, he was righteous. It's because he believed God. And when God gave him a message, amen, he gave him a message to separate, to leave his home, to make a full separation, to go to another land, and that he would receive a promised son. And he believed it. And because he believed it, righteousness was imputed unto him. Now him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. That's why you can have the very righteousness of God and not always do righteous deeds, but still have the righteousness of God. You say, that makes no sense to me. Just believe it, friends. It doesn't have to make any sense. It didn't have to make an ounce of sense, but it's what you believe. Hallelujah. We've got to keep moving. Then we come to Moses' day in the Exodus. Brother Benham says, I believe that God in the beginning, that Noah was the word for that day, for his message. Now along came after that came Moses. Now Moses could not have taken Noah's word. He could not have built a ship and floated them out of Egypt down the Nile River or to the promised land or so forth. His message didn't work in Noah's day. That was the part of God's word that was vindicated to be truth by Moses. So Moses, Noah couldn't preach Moses' part. Moses couldn't preach Noah's part. Noah had to preach his part. Moses had to preach his part. And you had to receive the part that was in front of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Joshua, they come to the possession of the land. Then they come to judges, and you had to follow the judges. Then they come to kings, you had to follow God's chosen through David and then Solomon. And then you come to the prophets going into the exile, and during the exile, coming out of the exile. And, and what is this? It's always the word for your day. And then you come to John the Baptist now. Now, John the Baptist is going to start talking about he which is coming and, and the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And, and now the whole substitutionary system is changing. And, and now he's going to come to the Lamb of God. And all the temple worship is going to be done away with. And it's going to be now null and void. And all the worship in Jerusalem is going to become obsolete. Can you imagine what a conniption fit they would have? And John the Baptist brought him to the ministry of Jesus Christ, and we read some of the scriptures where Jesus says, you're in darkness and his word's not in you because you don't believe whom God has sent. Brother Bram said in the absolute, I can see eternity break come down into time since Eden. And when it did, there come a line of blood all the way up to Calvary, and from Calvary tied with this line and goes on to the tie post Jesus. And someday when he comes to claim his own, everyone that's tied to that ultimate will be raised up into eternity. Why? They have been in eternity all this time. What? Did you hear what he said? When he comes, when Jesus comes, to claim his own, everyone that's tied to that ultimate will be raised up into eternity. Why? They have been in eternity all the time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They are part of God. They were in his thinking at the beginning, and when that big rope is pulled of the line of blood, that token I was speaking of, when it comes up from the earth, everyone that was included in that blood will be dropped right into eternity again. But the only way it'll be, it will be tied to that absolute Jesus Christ. So now when Jesus came and he manifested the word, he was manifesting what Moses had spoke of him. He was manifesting the foreshadowing of the ark. He was manifesting it all, fleshing out all of the word. He was manifesting the exodus. He was manifesting all of it. And here he comes, and when he dies, and when he sheds his blood for the price of redemption, now when he goes, everyone who was attached to that bloodline, 
I say the chains and the links of the chains. When that link presented itself in your day, the link of Noah's day, the link of Moses' day, if you were alive then, if you attach yourself to that link, amen, and you just hold on tight, you go to the grave with faith that I believe the word of God. When Christ came, the fullness of the word and was expressed on earth in a one-man body, when that died and paid the price of redemption, when he rose up and ascended, that whole chain went with him. I want to go back and look at something. You notice how these links turn red? As they're presented, that becomes your link to the blood. The link from yesterday is not your link to the blood. That's the path of the blood. That's the bloodline. That's the life of Christ coming all the way down through every attribute that's expressing in every age it's expressing in its day. And you're getting a hold of the bloodline as it comes, amen. But you cannot access the blood from any previous day or any future day. Your only access to that bloodline is the link that's right before you today. You've got to get a hold of that. You can't believe what mama and daddy and grandma and granddaddy did. They got a hold of the link in their day and they're fine. That's fine for them as long as they believe the word in that day. But now when he presents a further revelation of himself, the word in more maturity, you've got to get a hold of it right then and keep a hold of it and don't let go because that's your link to the blood. Hallelujah. Oh, the word is rich, friends. Now, now... Now you're beginning to understand, we've come to the realization of why denominational teaching cannot teach salvation. Can't happen, friends. Can't do it, because you have to walk in the light as he is in the light. Then you have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ atones for your sins. You cannot grab the link anywhere else but where it's presented in your day, and that's the only path to the blood. Hallelujah. Amen. So then we come out on the day of Pentecost. You have Peter and the apostles now preaching the gospel. You have to accept what they're telling you. Now Peter comes out on the inaugural day, the first message that was preached, and now they want to know how we're going to be saved. Of course they recognize that Jesus just died. Of course, they believed that he was the Lamb of God. They believed he was the Lamb of God. They believed that he had died. They were believing what Peter was saying, but they were saying, how can we be saved? And Peter didn't say, you already believe enough, you're okay. Because now there's another link coming, and now you've got to get a hold of the light for your day. And he says you must repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And they were here believing in the crucifixion, believing in the Lamb of God, believing in the atonement of the Lamb, believing all of it, and it had just happened. And though it had just happened, and though they were believing it, it still wasn't all that they needed for salvation. They now had to come to the further revelation of the Word. They had to come to the Holy Ghost dispensation, the Son of God. Then we find Apostle Paul coming on the scene, and then we know we have seven church ages, amen, and and we know all about these things, we've studied this, and that Laodicean church age, Brother Brenham calls it the Pentecostal age, and and the seventh church age, and and now we come, and you find out that in each one of these links, each one of these days, you had to accept the word for your day, Luther had, he couldn't accept Catholicism anymore. He had to accept the word for his day, the just shall live by faith. And as it moved on, you must accept the light. You must walk in the light as he's in the light. And that's your link to the blood. You say, I believe in Calvary. I believe in Calvary too. A lot of people believe in Calvary. Amen. But believing in Calvary, anybody can believe in Calvary just like anybody can believe in a substitutionary lamb when God had slain a lamb to cover for his son. They could have believed in that. But can you believe in him now? Can you believe in the word made flesh? Can you believe in the word for your day? Because if you reject this, you reject that. 
It's that simple. You've got to have a link to the blood. You've got to have some way that the blood can atone for you. And how? Walk in the light as he is in the light. That's your link to the blood. Brother Benham says in the future home of the heavenly bridegroom and the earthly bride, look how all kinds of forms those Pharisees had. But when the word was made manifest, they didn't recognize it. See? And if you are the bride, the bride is part of the husband. And the only place that you'll ever recognize it is to recognize what part of the husband, the word, you are. What part are you? Or you can't recognize being the bride. How many sees that? See, you have to recognize your position. Brother Branham said he was building back his body in this masterpiece, amen? And he was building back the female part of Christ and he built it from the feet and the legs and built it all the way up, all the way up to the neck and then the headship comes and you have to know what part of that husband you are. Are you feet? Are you legs? Are you arms? What part of that manifestation are you? Head. Amen. Not any previous age, not any previous day, but we've come down to the uniting of the head and the body, and amen, and the bride has moved into the headship. The headship's moved into the bride. You have to know what, recognize your position. You can't recognize somebody else's. What if Moses would have come with Noah's message and Noah was part of it, but it wouldn't have worked? If Jesus would have come with Moses' message, it wouldn't have worked, see? It was a different age, it was a different prophecy, a different part of the word that had to be fulfilled there. They was in another day of the week. Not Tuesday's work can't be done on Wednesday. The Wednesday has got to be done on Wednesday, see? Saturday has to be Saturday's work, see? And they was recognized, oh Moses, we have Moses. He said, if you'd hadn't known Moses, you would have known me, for he was the one that spoke of me. The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet <coughs> like unto me. Get the idea? Oh my. Hallelujah. Now see, remember, I gave an analogy several weeks back about me, the name, my name, my name of Chad Lamb, and, and I, I gave the analogy, you could know Chad Lamb at five years old, you could know Chad Lamb at 10 years old, and you could have really known me. You could have really known what I liked at that age, what I didn't like, where I went to school, and who my family members were. You could have known all about me at 12 years old, and I could have had a friend at school at 12 years old, and then I would have separated and went to another school and went to another place, amen, and 20 years go by, and then I get married, amen, and then I begin to have children, and then I get an occupation and a career, and I move to a different city, amen, and all of a sudden, a man will hear 20 years later the name Chad Lamb. He goes, I know Chad Lamb. He's 12 years old, he goes to this school, he likes to play baseball, and, and he likes this kind of candy. He doesn't know who I am, he knows who I was, but he doesn't know who I am. Amen. Amen. And see, that's the way it is with Christ, amen? You can know what he was in another age and where he was at and how he acted and what he did, but you can't know him until you know him where he is today in the revelation of what he is today. Then you really know who he is. You can say, I love Jesus Christ. If you love Jesus Christ as a 12-year-old boy, but you refuse him now as the full maturity of the word and bride form, then you don't love Jesus Christ. That sounds harsh, but you have no idea who he is. How can you love somebody that you don't know? The whole denominational world loves a Jesus Christ who died on the cross and resurrected the third day. But they don't know who he is today. They don't know where he is, where he's at. They don't know who he's married to. They don't know what work he's doing. They don't know what part of the word he's fulfilling. They have no idea who he is. They love an idea. They love an idea. They love a concept. They love something in the past. But they do not love Jesus Christ. That sounds bad, but that's the truth. So that was my analogy, but I'm gonna give you a different one. Now there was this boy named Chad Lamb and he grew up and he was five and he was 10 and he was all these different, I didn't jump from five to 10, you know, I did all the ones in between. But I come all the way through school and I did all of these things and, 
And at 17 years old, I met a girl, and that girl knew me at 17 years old. She, she saw me, she met me, she learned my name, amen? And, and then she got to know me better for, for two years, and she started learning about my past. She had never known me in my past, but she started learning about my past. And I explained to her where I went to school and who my friends were and who my family was, amen? She was with me now, and with me now, I could explain to her the past. I, present tense, could give her a full revelation of the past. I can tell her every school I went to. I could tell her what I used to like, what I didn't used to like. I could tell her every transition that I made and every link in the chain and every place I had been and everything that had happened to me, every injury that I had had, all my acceptance and all my rejections. How could she get it? She had to come to me now and meet a living, breathing, present-day Chad, and she could get the revelation of the entire past of my life. Then after two years of learning and getting to know me, amen, I asked her to marry me, and she said yes, which was a miracle. <laughs> Praise God. At 19 years old, but we were almost 20. I keep telling my kids that. Blake turns 19 this year. We were almost 20. <laughs> amen. And she married me because she knew me. And I had revealed to her all the desires she had of the past, what she wanted to know, and all the questions I had answered. She marries me, but I don't stay 19 forever. I, I continue to mature, and I continue to change, and there's more revelation of the nature of Chad. There was attributes inside of me that had to be expressed, amen? There was a whole genetic code that needed physical expression. There was a whole spiritual code that needed spiritual expression, and as time goes on, more is expressed, and more is expressed, and more is expressed. Then after several years, she, she began to know me as a technician, and I used to do repair on industrial equipment, and I was her husband, and she knew my past, and she knew what I did, and, and then we begin to have children. She begins to know me as a father. She never knew me as a father before. She didn't know what kind of father I would be. She didn't know how I'd be with children, but she has to stay with me to get these revelations. And now... We, we have that, that life together as a young married couple, young family, and she knows me as a technician, but after many years, God transitions me, and now I become a business owner, and now she knows me as a business owner. And then God calls me into the ministry, and she knows me as a minister. And then God calls me into pastor, and now she has to know me as a pastor. Now see, there's no point in the journey where we can, she can come and say, you know what? I don't like you as pastor. I liked you as technician. And I liked you in your early years as a father. I don't really like you as a father over teenagers. I liked you as a father over little kids. And I liked you as a technician. I liked it when you just went to work and come home. And I don't like you as pastor, and I don't like you as a father of teenagers, and I don't like you, you know, the way you look now, and you know how that goes. I liked you then, and I loved you then, and why can't you just stay 19, 20 years old? That's what the systems have done to Jesus Christ. And if my wife along the journey ever rejects me, rejects me at 25, rejects me at 30, rejects me as a technician, rejects me as a minister, rejects me as a pastor. If she ever rejects me, then she ceases to be my wife. Do you get the picture? If you walk in the light as he is in the light, you can't ever reject him. He can't reject him when he moves from Lutheran age to Wesley age, you can't reject him. When he moves from the Wesleyan age to the Pentecost, you can't reject him. You can't say, I don't like all that noise and that speaking in tongues scares me to death and I don't believe in laying on of hands. You can't reject him. He's maturing, the word is maturing. He's coming into greater manifestation all the time. And you can't reject him. But I'd like to say, neither can you reject him now. because he made another transition at the end of the church ages. And you can't reject that one either. 
In Pentecost, Brother Branham comes on the scene. Now, Brother Branham says some interesting things in the church ages. Brother Branham shows us a pattern for church age messengers, and he shows us that every church age messenger came, was born in the previous church age. Every single one of them was born in the previous church age, and they come to life and come to maturity, and through their ministry, the church age rolled over and changed. Is that what he said? But if you look at the little, the little picture in the front of your church age book and it has the dates of the messengers and if you can find the one, I know it's in uh, the one that Brother George Smith just put together. He's got the date of the ages and then he's got the, lie, he's got the birth and the death of each messenger. And you go through there and if you look, you see that every single church age messenger was born in the previous church age and their life brought a change. Is that true? Until you get to the seventh. And when you get to the seventh, it's the first time that now the church age messenger isn't born in the previous church age. Brother Branham wasn't born in the Philadelphian church age. He was born after the Azusa Street Revival. He was born after the gifts came back. He was born after the Laodicean church age began. Which means what? He's here to bring a change from Laodicea at the ending of the Laodicean church age to something else. Amen. That's why Brother Brennan would say odd things like, now really the church age messenger for this age is the Holy Ghost. Now was he the seventh church age messenger? Absolutely, we all believe that, we won't change that. But he was more than just the seventh church age messenger, amen. He was here to bring a transition. That's why he shows us the pattern so carefully explains each one's born in a previous age. Each one, and then you think he didn't know he wasn't born in the previous age? Amen? He's laying down mysteries. So when we get to the end of the Pentecostal age, now I wanna be careful and I want you to re re recognize, and I've told you this before, that Brother Branham told us that the Laodicean church age in the natural goes to tribulation, goes to chaos and destruction, amen, goes to the rapture of the church and the battle of Armageddon and all of those things. So we know that the Laodicean church age must continue on to tribulation and to chaos. But redemption is going to change. The where he's redeeming, where he is, where the blood is, your access to the blood is changing because you could find it in a Pentecostal age until something changed. And when something changed, you can no longer find your access to the blood through a Pentecostal age. You can't go to the Pentecostal age right now and find redemption. We're supposed to come out of that thing, lift out of that to find redemption. So Brother Branham comes, I'm gonna say he comes at the end of the age for redemption. And he brings a transition out of the seventh church age into the bride age. There's another link on the chain that we're living in today, friends. Naturally, the world's in Laodicea. Naturally, it goes into, it goes into chaos. But spiritually, we've been lifted out of Laodicea. The rapture cycle has already begun. We've been lifted already out of that thing through the open door. And now, there's another link, amen. And at the opening of the seven seals, now comes the fullness of the word, the bride coming of Christ. Revelations 10, eight to 11, and the Son of Man ministry. Hallelujah. We keep reading about this. Brother Brennan said in the message, 1965, uh, uh, November 27th, I have heard but now I see. Now it's beginning to pull away. The wheat's beginning to be seen. This is not a Pentecostal age. This is the latter day age. This is the bride age. This is evening light. This is Malachi 4 must be fulfilled to follow God's pattern. This is Luke 17.30 to be fulfilled. What's Luke 17.30? The revealing of the Son of Man. This is the second, and Jeremiah and all the rest of them that Joel has spoke of these days, this is that day. I have heard, Lord, and it was coming, but now I see it with my eyes. He says, in modern events made clear by prophecy, December 1965. This is all just right before he dies. This is all November and December, just before he passes off the scene. Modern events, no, I'm sorry, modern events made clear by prophecy, that's correct. 
We're not living in a Pentecostal age. We're living in another age. I hope you're not living in a Pentecostal age. Is your body stuck in Laodicea? Absolutely, but greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen, he has lifted me out of Laodicea, and this quickening power that quickened me to life is actually quickening my body out of Laodicea. It's quickening out of lethargy. It's quickening out of lust. It's quickening me out of all of that. Laodicea is losing its hold, friends. We're not living in a Pentecostal age, we're living in another age. We're not living in a Methodist age, we're living in another age. We're living on up here to the bride age. The calling out of the church and getting it together for the rapture. That's the age that we're now living. To my honest opinion, that's exactly the truth. Further, in modern events made clear by prophecy, what time is it that we're living in? Something like a calendar, you look at the calendar to find out what day of the year you're living in, and you look at God's Bible to see what age we're living in. We're not living in the Methodist age, the Baptist age. We're living in the bride age, the calling, bringing back to God through a channel that he promised to bring it back in. He promised to do it. So now, amen, don't, don't be stuck in denominations and in church ages and the Pentecostal age, but we've got to move beyond that, amen, into the bride age to recognize the fullness of the word has come, amen. Now he's here in the Son of Man ministry. He's here in the fullness of the word, amen. This is a different day than what it was. You can't reject him where he's at. In the message leadership, December again, 1965, didn't Jesus say in the last days, Matthew 24, 24, the two would be so close, it would deceive the very genes predestinated, the elect ones, if it was possible? Almost like the real thing, see? So in the last days, now you see it's wheat time now. Now you know why this is so important? He said it's wheat time now. Because he begins to talk about the Reformation, amen? And in the Reformation, he talks about the wheat coming out of the ground through Luther, and he talks about the blade and the stalk and the tassel and the shuck, right? And he said there was three stages of it, and the three stages were Luther, Wesley, Pentecost. Do we have that? Is that true? So now we've got, we come up through the stalk, we come up through the tassel, we come up through the shuck, but now he's saying we're not in any of those ages. We're back to wheat again. He's talking about a fourth stage. Only there's no fourth stage of the Reformation. Brother Branham calls Pentecostal age, he says it's the third stage of the Reformation. He said there's the martyrs age of it. That's when they were giving their lives through it, down through the dark ages. Then there was the Reformation with three stages, Luther, Wesley, Pentecost. But after that, it's back to original grain again. Not Pentecostal age, not Laodicean age. It's gone beyond that, back to the original grain again. If you walk in the light as he is in the light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, it's wheat time now. It's getting harvest time. This is not Luther's age. This is not Pentecostal age. This is the bride age. As Moses called a nation out of a nation, Christ today is calling a church out of a church. You see, the same thing in type, taking them to the glorious eternal promised land. <coughs> the wheat was one type, but Brother Branham brought another type in the message countdown. In the message countdown, 1962, Brother Branham says, now we've passed through the Pentecostal age. We've passed through the Lutheran age. We've passed through the Wesleyan age, the Wesley age. Look, as soon as that church started, God began to show signs in the earth showing that he was advancing his church from justification to sanctification to the baptism of the Holy Ghost and now to the astronaut. Every time Brother Ben shows us this, he's showing us four because the number of deliverance is four. The fourth seal is the rapture. The fourth chapter of Revelations is the rapture. He's always showing us four. He's showing us, he's showing us stalk, tassel, shuck, grain. He's showing us now through countdown. He said through Luther's age it was the horse and buggy, and then Wesley's age became the automobile, and he's showing how science advancement is always forerun, foreshadowing what God's advancements and achievements are. And so now Luther's day was the, was the horse and buggy. Wesley's day was the automobile. He says, but the Pentecostal age has been the airplane flying up over the earth in spiritual atmospheres. 
He says, but now we're called to the astronaut age, amen, leaving the natural, leaving the physical, amen, and going into the supernatural. You see the four again, friends, the number of deliverance, amen. He says, justification made a way for sanctification. Sanctification made a way for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost made a way for the Holy Ghost himself. That's the light for this day. That's the age we live in. That's salvation. That's your link to the blood. That's redemption and the day that we live in. Hallelujah. I want to look at one more thing as we wind down. Amen. And prepare to close. Improving his word. I want to read two quotes or three. And I want to look at the Son of Man ministry. Because we know that the Son of Man ministry is the ministry of Jesus Christ himself. So what Brother Ben tells us. It's the ministry of Jesus Christ himself. And there's a prophecy in Luke 17, 30 that says, as it, was in the days, <clears throat> as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And he, and he starts to say, uh, the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So Brother Branham does something very interesting. I'll pull it out in the quote and show you. But Brother Branham takes the coming of the Son of Man and equals it to the revealing of the Son of Man. And the revealing of the Son of Man is Luke 17, 30, and Brother Brennan attaches that to his ministry over and over and over. He said, this is the revealing of the Son of Man, and the days of the revealing of the Son of Man, as it was in Noah's day, as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot's day, so shall it be, amen? amen. But now he draws an equal sign between the, the coming of the Son of Man, coming of the Son of Man, and the revealing of the Son of Man. Here's what he says, improving his word. Now we say he's raised from the dead. I didn't say it, the word here said it. They said he's raised from the dead. He says he's the same yesterday, today, yesterday and forever. You believe that? He promised these things to happen in the last day, that the same Son of Man will be made manifest. Now remember, that was not Jesus talking to Abraham here that could discern the thoughts in Sarah's mind behind him. That was not Jesus. He had not yet been born. But it was a man in human flesh that Abraham called Elohim, the great almighty. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, and now watch close, in the days of Sodom, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man when the Son of Man is being revealed. I hope you're not waiting for the coming of the Son of Man. I hope you're in the coming of the Son of Man. I hope you are the coming of the Son of Man. I want to read that again because it's so good. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom. Now watch close. In the days of Sodom, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man when the Son of Man is being revealed. Not no more as a church, see, not no more. The bride is called. See, in the day the Son of Man will be revealed. What? To join the church to the head, unite the marriage of the bride. The bridegroom call will come right through this when the Son of Man will come down and come in human flesh to unite the two together. Hallelujah, friends. Did that happen in the prophet's ministry? Absolutely, without a doubt, it happened in the prophet's ministry. And he came down in flesh, in the flesh of a prophet, and it was the revealing of the Son of Man. The Son of Man had come, and he revealed himself, amen, a Son of Man revealing the Son of Man to do what? To unite the body and the head, the bridegroom and the bride. That was the purpose. Amen. Son of man will come down and come in human flesh to unite the two together. The church has to be the word. He is the word, and the two unites together. And to do that, it'll take the manifestation of the revealing of the son of man, not a clergyman. Do you see what I mean? It's the son, it, it's son of man, Jesus Christ, will come down in human flesh among us and will make his word so real that it'll unite the church and him as one. The bride, and then she'll go home to the wedding supper, amen. She's already united, see, we go to the wedding supper, not to the marriage. But the rapture is going to the wedding supper. When the word here unites with the person, and they too become one, and then what does it do then? It manifests the Son of Man again. 
I don't know if you caught that, so we're going to read it again. The Son of Man will come down in human flesh and be the revealing of the Son of Man, Luke 17, 30. That was Brother Brandon's ministry, right? What's the purpose of that? To unite the bride and the bridegroom, the body and the head, to unite them together. The union takes place here. The marriage takes place here. They're being married together. Now he's going to tell you why they're being married together. And that's what we have to catch in our day. We have to understand why they're being married together. And he says right here, amen, the, the, the two become one. And then what does it do then? It manifests the Son of Man again. Who? The prophet? No, you. He's talking about the ministry of the Son of Man in the bride. The bride coming of Christ. Christ coming in the formation of the bride. That's the day and age we live in. That's the light as he's in the light. That's your path to the blood. That's your link in the chain. That is your link to the Calvary right there. And if you reject that, you reject the blood because the life of the blood has returned and is right here in the fullness of the word. And if you reject that, you have rejected your, your lamb. You have rejected your husband. Amen. And you can't be married to him if you reject him. You can believe in a prophet all you want to believe in a prophet. And you can believe in the Son of Man ministry in the seventh church age all that you want to believe in it. And you can believe in the opening of the seals all you want to believe in it. But if you miss the ministry of the Son of Man today in the form of his bride, you have missed him. We can talk about what happened, but what's happening We can talk about how wonderful he was, but how wonderful is he? Is he only wonderful then? Is he only present then? Was he only present to unite the two and then he vanished away? And then what does it do? It manifests the Son of Man again. Not the church theologians, the Son of Man. The word and the church becomes one. Whatever the Son of Man done, he was the word. The church does the same thing. 1965, God's provided place of worship. But he promised just before the coming of the end time, the world would get like it was in Sodom when a man come down in human form. Three of them, two angels, Oral Roberts, Billy Graham, in case you don't know what he's talking about. Two angels and God himself. Now, he's not saying Brother Brandon was God. But, but the fullness of God was coming down, and there was a son of man revealing the son of man. He was working through the man. Two angels and God himself. That was God. The Bible said it was. Now he come down and he manifest himself there by turning his back to the tent where Sarah was and told Abraham and Sarah what was thinking in the tent. That right? What's he trying to get you to see? He even explains this in one place. He says, now I'm going to turn my back to the congregation. What's he trying to get us to see, friends? The church will come through. I'm sorry. I turned my back to the tent where Sarah was and told Abraham and Sarah what was thinking in the tent. Now Jesus himself at the day when the Son of Man is being revealed, in other words, the Son of Man, the ministry of Jesus Christ himself. The church will come through justification, through Luther, through sanctification, through Wesley, through baptism of the Holy Ghost or the Pentecostals, and go right on into perfection of the Son of Man. Hallelujah. There's some place to go beyond the third stage of the Reformation, beyond the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That was to unite you with him. The marriage. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. At the day when the Son of Man is being revealed, in other words, the Son of Man, the ministry of Jesus Christ itself, I I read that the church will come through all this and go right on into perfection of the Son of Man, that when husband and wife will be the self, the same self person. Now listen, friends. We got to quit acting like we know what that means. He's saying when the husband and the wife will be the same self person. 
Well, I'm waiting for him to come. He's come. He's come. Where? In the formation of the bride. In bride form. The fullness of the life, the fullness of the word, the fullness of his person has come. The only thing that hasn't come is the corporal body. Everything else has come. Everything that was in the corporal body has come. I don't know about you, but this body that I'm made out of is not who I am. There's a life inside this body that is who I am. And when this body lays down and this body dies, I'm still going to continue on because I'm more than this body, amen. If you've got what's inside of me, you've got me, whether my body's present or not. And if his body's not present, but you have everything that was in the body here, what do you have? You have him. When husband and wife will be the same self person, God will be so manifested into his bride, his church, till they will both be the same. That's why when the world rejects her, they have rejected him. 1964, the unveiling of God. But God is still here to make that just the same. Notice, what does it do? It finally returns back to the original seed again. When he come in the form of Martin Luther, when he come in the form of John Wesley, when he come in the form of Pentecostal, he is supposed to reveal himself again like the same seed went in, the son of man. He revealed himself as son of God through the stalk age and so forth, but in this last age, he's to reveal himself as son of man again. Not just in the prophet, but in you and me. The invisible union the bride of Christ. The word that fell on the day of Pentecost will not work this day. No, sir, that was for Pentecost. This is for the bride, going home of the bride. We got something different. The Pentecostals, which is the seventh church age, represented that again. We're in the bride age. No more than the word of Noah would work in the days of Moses. No more than Moses' law would have worked in the time of Paul. Brother Bram says in an absolute, I don't make any difference what others want to believe. To the individual, you are tied to that. Brother Branham pats his Bible. He says, you're tied to that. That's your ultimate. That's the last word. And then if he is the word, then this must be the last word. This must settle it. Whatever that says, that's that scarlet thread that is Christ. What? The word through the ages. And anything contrary to that, I know nothing about it. That's what we want to know is what the word says. For I am tied to Christ, and Christ is the word. Not was, but is. You get it now? And the portion of his word that's lauded for this day, his Holy Spirit is here to manifest that portion of the word. And the real born-again people of this age that's filled with the Holy Ghost is the tie post of this scripture that's got to be fulfilled in these last days. I'm gonna read that one more time and we're gonna do it slowly. Because I think sometimes we read, we're like, yeah, I've heard that, yeah, I know what that is, but no, because if we really believed that, it would, it would be different around here. If we really understood that in the full revelation of what it means, things would be a whole lot different in your life. Things would be a whole lot different in my life. Amen. We can't stay on the ground any longer. Amen. We can't stay in carnal thinking and carnal things. But things are changing. All around us, things are changing. He says, I want to start back at the, word, the portion of this word that's lauded for this day. His Holy Spirit is here to manifest that portion of the word. So what portion is for today? Everything that's promised of the virgin, that's the portion for today. And the real born-again people of this age that's filled with the Holy Ghost is the tie post of this scripture that's got to be fulfilled in these last days. They are the ultimate. Who's the ultimate? Those real born-again believers in this last day that's got this portion of the word to be fulfilled, they are the ultimate. It's God's ultimate because it's his word, and the word is Christ, the tie post. So then you got to say, what are you? What am I? What is this bride? Amen. 
She's the Word made flesh. She's the scriptures for this day. She's the tie post in flesh. She is Christ in bride form. She is the Son of Man ministry in a many-membered bride. She is Him. She is the ultimate. She is the expression of the word for this day. She is the only provided place of worship. She is the temple of God. She is the habitation of God. She is the ark of the covenant. She is the place where he sits. She is the inner veil. We gotta believe it, friends. We can't talk about it. We gotta believe it. We gotta act on it. We gotta cry out for it. We gotta say, God, hey, the life I lived yesterday is not good enough for tomorrow. I see your promise for today, and I see what you wanna do, and you've got a vessel right here you can use, but you've gotta wash me out. You've gotta burn me out. You've gotta do something that I can't do myself, but I see it, and I realize it, and I want it, and I'm calling out for it. You can have this vessel. Who would say, Lord, you can have this vessel? I can't do it in the strength of my mind. I can't do it in the strength of my arms. But there's a seed on the inside that's been quickened alive that came from God. Amen. And the Holy Ghost is here making that portion live for this day, saying, it's me. Amen. It's me. It's not. I saw that there was a prophet, seventh church age, the opening of the seals. I saw the Son of Man ministry. And now I'm just going to sit and wait and wait and wait, and wait, until there's something, something special happens, and then all of a sudden, everything's gonna change, and I'm gonna go mysteriously in a rapture somehow. That's not it, friends. It's recognizing your position. Identifying yourself in the book. Recognizing what the link to the chain is today, and then recognizing that the link's in you. The link's inside of you, amen. The light's in you. And if you walk in the light as he is in the light, the light, where's the light? The light's in the manifested word. Where's the manifested word? Inside the bride. I'm looking for a light. It's in flesh, friends. It's veiled behind skins again. When the apostle Paul was here, amen, he was called out by the Holy Ghost and said, you shall be a light to the Gentiles. They're looking for the prophecy to be fulfilled, looking for a light to come. What is the light? It was the apostle Paul. He was the light. The light was inside of him. And if you walk in the light as he is in the light, amen, amen. then the blood of Jesus Christ atones for you. Where's the light? In the body. Who's the body? The many-membered body of Jesus Christ. The light's in you and I, friends. Don't wait for something to happen. Start claiming your position. Start calling out for the promises for your day. Say, Lord, you showed us that the same ministry that you had on earth must be in the grain at the end time. And we had a prophet who told us we're past stalk. We're past tassel. We are past shuck. We are now in the grain. And the only thing we're waiting for, amen, as the shuck is pulled back, we're just waiting for it to lay in the presence of the sun to come to full harvest maturity. We're not waiting for grain. We're waiting for maturity. We're already in the fourth phase. We're already in the final stage. We've already come out of Laodicea. We're already in the bride age. We have already begun the rapture cycle. Quit waiting, saying, oh, sunlight, bake me out. What is the sun? The revealed word for this day. Get in it. Stay under it. Quit letting things distract you, amen. Quit taking things of the world and putting it up as an umbrella and blocking the light from your life. Take everything away and say, oh, hot sun, bake me out. Oh, hot sun of the revelation of the word, bake me Bake all the moisture out of me until the life that I reflect in this temple right here is the same life that walked by the Sea of Galilee. I am not content with anything else anymore. I'm not content saying, well, that's how my mama was or that's how my daddy was or that's just me. That's not right because there's got to be somebody on this earth that will manifest the very life of Jesus Christ again and I'm not content saying, well, that's just who I am. That's just my personality. You're gonna have to deal with me because my mama was this and my grandma was that. That's not my heritage. My heritage is eternal. 
I'm not claiming that anymore. I'm saying the ministry of the Son of Man, the very same ministry that was here when he was here, has to be here in the bride. I say, let it be right here. Let me do nothing to to obscure the light. Let it shine through me, Lord. Let it shine through this vessel. Don't let me darken it by some habit, by some compromise, by some something I've allowed. But Lord, I'm laying it all here and I'm saying, bake me out, God. I see that there's more. There's more for me to do than just wait for the rapture. I am the rapture. I'm right in it. It's happening. I'm not waiting. I'm not waiting to watch something happen and then all of a sudden my faith will get to a place where I, I've over. No, I'm growing in faith. Growing. The faith is already here, friends. It's come. What came back in the opening of the seals, the seven thunders? What came back? The faith for a rapture. Well, I'm waiting for faith for a rapture. It's come back. Just stay in it till it unlocks in your heart, until it becomes a reality to you. Hallelujah. This word, it wasn't given to us to talk about. It wasn't given to us to make pamphlets and charts. And it was given to us to show us who we are, to awaken us. What is the message? I ask myself that so many times. If I could boil it down, what is the message? You could answer all kinds of ways, and we could all answer and all be correct. So don't just take what I say. But to me, the heart of the message has been the return of Christ in his bride. To me, that's become the heart of the message. Because the seventh church age messenger has come and gone. The seventh church age dispensation, it's going on, but not for me. The church has been called out. Really, the heart of the message for me is he's here that he came secretly into the seventh feast. He slipped in and nobody knew he come. How did he slip in and nobody knew he come? He came undercover. First, he slipped in in a prophet's ministry, a seventh grade educated prophet from Kentucky. And he came and that ministry came through that man to do what? To unite the head and the body together. And then God took that ministry off the scene, and he himself is here. In every way but the corporal body, he's here. Where is he? He's tabernacled in flesh. Deity tabernacled in flesh. And that's become the heart of the message to me. There's a lot of other correct answers. You could say a lot of things, and it's right. It's right. The message is a lot of things. But to me... I'm realizing that God is right here. And I've got to die more. And I've got to let it live more. I've got to stop waiting and start living. I've got to stop looking for something and start believing what we already have. Stop looking for something else and believe what's already been given. That's what the message is to me. A realization of who I am. Am. Let's all stand. Musicians, if you could come. Brother Jim, if you can make your way up. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. God, we want to grab a hold of this trail of blood, Lord. You've passed it through every age and through everything, Lord, and you brought it to us fresh in our day. And Lord, where the fresh kill of the word is, that's where the eagles will be gathered. Lord, and I just pray, God, that you would reveal to us that fresh kill of your word. Lord, that we wouldn't look somewhere else to something in the past or something in the future, but we would recognize you here now. Open our eyes to see it, Lord. God, we want to live it so bad. Our desire, Lord, is to lift out of ourselves, get beyond carnality, get beyond all these things that bind us, and really step into the vision, Lord, really step into the prophecy that's been spoken by a prophet about us. Lord, I pray that you just burn us out, Lord. Let that sunlight of your revealed word just burn and bake all the greenness out of us, all the moisture out of us, until we reflect you on this earth in perfect fashion, Lord. God, I give you my life afresh, and I ask that you take me, Lord, as a sacrifice again. 
Lord, slay the sacrifice and live your life through me. We love you for what you're doing. We love you for what you've spoken to us and what you've told us and how we see where you are today. Lord, let us not just talk about it, but let us live it, Lord, right now in Jesus Christ's name. We love you, God. Lord, you can use anything. You can certainly use me. Lord, you, you just need a vessel, Lord, and you've predestinated this to be your vessel. And I say use it greater than you ever have in the past. I give up all my rights and all my desires and all my thoughts. I give them up, Lord, and I say, take me, almighty God. Use me for your purposes only. I love you, Lord. I so appreciate you, God. Let us shine the light, Lord, that that last seed might see it and make their way safely to you, Lord. That they might grab a hold of the link of the chain that goes all the way into eternity, Lord. Oh, God, that, that links them to the blood of the lamb that was slain. Let us shine that true light of the gospel, that true blood of atonement. You told us in this day, Lord, that, that, that the message in this day brought us to the true atonement, which is the word. Let us get a hold of that and let us offer it to others, Lord. Not a false atonement of a previous day, but the true atonement in our day, the bleeding, bloody word. We love you, God, and we ask that you would do these things for your glory. We give ourselves to you in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, saints. Give a song, brother. I like that song. We're going to let you be dismissed with this song. You can stay in worship if you'd like. We're going to sing, He is here. Amen. He is here.